Hello and welcome to the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. Whether you can't get out of bed in the morning, your energy crashes throughout the day, or you're a biohacker looking to optimize your energy, productivity, and focus, this podcast is for you. I am Dr. Evan Hirsch, and I will be your host on your journey to resolving fatigue and optimizing your energy. And we'll be interviewing some of the top leaders in the world on fatigue resolution. Welcome. Hey, everybody, Dr. Evan Hirsch here with another episode on the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. So glad that you're here with me today. So I'm really excited about today's episode. Today, we have Jessica Smith with me. Jessica is a certified ecological farmer and nutritional therapy practitioner. She's got a BS in sustainable living and living soils, and she combines her passions to encourage the earth and its inhabitants back into a state of balance and vitality, which is so important and so much of what we talk about. She teaches regenerative and ecological farming, gardening and farming in hopes to improve soil health, eco ecosystem health, environmental health and human health. Jessica, thanks so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So the first thing that I want to jump into is your story. You know, everybody's got a story about why they why they got to where they are. So, you know, what, and, 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 and it informs, you know, so much of what we do. So if you could just share that with us, that would be great. Yes, I would, I would love to. Um, so I started out growing food with my grandpa when I was a kid. I've been growing food since I can remember. He's always had a garden, always had chickens or something happening in the backyard to, to grow some awesome food. And those are some of my fondest memories. My grandpa actually has this picture that he saved for blackmail uh, of me. <laughs> it's of me in my underwear in front of a, a plum tree, which was my favorite at, at the time as a kid. And I had plum juice all over my face so and all down my body. So I was always in the garden, um, always growing with him. And really, that was just normal. Every summer, you could expect lots and lots of fresh tomatoes and he would grow like 50 different varieties and like hundreds of tomato plants. So my childhood was just filled with like positive and like wonderful memories of tasty food. And then uh, when I was, you know, getting a little bit older and I was in high school, um, or I was just beginning to get into that age range. One time I remember I was sitting on the back deck with my grandpa, just kind of looking out over the fields and stuff and over the yard. And he told me that if you take care of the land, it'll take care of you. And from that moment on, I was just, oh, wow, like, that's what we should be doing. We should, like, it's so amazing to feel like you can, you can put your love into something and that will be reciprocated with abundance. And so from then on, I decided to go to school for sustainable living and living soils. And then that kind of triggered, like, human health as, like, an aspect of, like, it's so interconnected. And then um, from there, I went in and now I'm working on a master's in soil science to help try to teach people how to really put life back into the soil and how that can create a super vibrant, like medicinal food and everyday produce. So really, it's just growing awesome food and it feels amazing. And I want everybody to be able <laughs> to have that same feeling. Awesome. Yeah, there's yeah. something really special about reconnecting with nature. Yes. Right? Yes. And so there's something that you mentioned. Let's dive into that, you know, like mm -hmm. putting life back into the soil. So so where have we gone wrong? What what happened with our soil? Right. Well, the where where we went wrong was we started treating soil like dirt. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> really That's like great. when when you treat it like an an, an like a just like Bad, like non-living object, then you're going to get a result that's uh, not as vibrant as it could be. So what we can do is because, you know, putting chemicals or pesticides or herbicides or um, different antimicrobials into the soil, what we've learned is that this actually short circuits the system because in nature, like in the forest, nobody's putting fertilizer down, but the plants are growing. And um, really, we don't have to, when you have the diversity, there's no imbalances. So what we've gone wrong is we think that we can improve what's already perfect. Like we think we can make nature better, but 
what makes nature better is when we understand it and support it. And so we can kind of shift it in the direction. So with gardening and stuff like, like growing your own food, what you can do is, you know, make sure you're not using chlorinated water because that is put into the water to disinfect it of microbes. And that's inherently going to disinfect the soil microbes. Mm. So in the plant's rhizosphere, there's actually beneficial microbes that help break down nutrients and feed them to the plant. And then the plant feeds the microbes. So there's a symbiotic relationship happening. And this is how we get healthy plants is by supporting life, making sure our soil is moist, making sure it's covered and not disturbing it all the time. That's so great. <laughs> so let's dive into health. You know, let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. You know, obviously I focus on fatigue and energy. So how can going through this process and, and gardening, how can it improve energy and even mood? Yes. Yeah, so when it comes to gardening, um, there's so many facets to how it boosts health and, and boosts your energy. And the first one being fresh air, you usually are going outside. And for some people that makes the biggest difference. Like uh, my partner's mom called us the other day and she was like, I'm having such a great day. I feel so good. And she was so like lively and happy. We we're like, what'd you do? She's like, I opened the windows and I went outside. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like fresh air is, is so enlivening and it's full of so many good things. And what we don't realize is that a lot of times the air quality in our houses are, is actually pretty poor. And so really getting outside in the fresh air and the, the negative ions and all the different microbes and, and beneficials that are happening, it kind of just boosts our mood in a way. Um, so that's the first component is just fresh air and then sunlight making the vitamin D and all the supporting cofactors that help you absorb nutrients and stuff like that. So getting sun, some, something about sunlight is like, it just, you can't help but smile when there's like sun hitting you. Um, and then also the physical activity. So getting your lymphatic system flowing, you need that in order to detox and, and, and kind of help your system reduce the burden of any, anything that might be weighing you down. And then also, um, there's something so peaceful and soothing and healing about working with plants and being in nature. So the, there's the studies in the hospital, we're just having pictures of plants in nature in the rooms, improved recovery rates of, of sick patients. So nature therapy and getting outside is so healing in that sense. Then there's also soil. And so there's a specific microbe called MVK and it's also known as the golden bacillus of happiness. And what happens is as soon as you come into contact with that physically, it boosts serotonin levels in your brain and it, it makes you feel happy and energized. And it's almost like the earth is like coaxing you to like come near it and be outside. And so uh, besides growing the awesome food itself, that's so much nutritionally beneficial, uh, it's just being outside and being present in that moment with nature and, and letting the whole system kind of support you and lift your mood and lift your energy. And every time I've worked with students out in the garden or when Joe and I um, were out in his garden, he, he said he couldn't be stressed. He couldn't like feel drugged down. So there is this, it, it's like a respite from, you know, the heavy burden of, you know, everyday life and, and different things that we might be going through, we kind of just leave them all behind and we kind of recollect ourselves and reconnect um, with that kind of source of life. So there's so many ways that gardening is super, super awesome. I always feel energized after gardening. And just besides that, it also helps you just, um, you know, have more access to fresh food. So you, you're growing it and it's there and it's around you. So you're going to be eating more fresh produce. Um, so that's also helps boost your energy as well. Yeah, I love that. You know, you didn't even really talk about the nutritional value of the food. You're talking <laughs> about everything that's kind of leading up to it, which is something that oftentimes that we forget, you know, mm -hmm. is that it's, it's giving us all of these essential lifestyle basics like movement 
you know, like air, like sun, like, you know, getting down into the dirt. You know, it's, I think about the pictures of my daughter who's now 11 years old, mm -hmm. you know, shoving, shoving the dirt into her mouth. And while you were talking <laughs> about that M. bacillus or whatever it was, you know, <laughs> increasing her serotonin levels, it was like, that's why, you know, maybe that's why kids love just eating that dirt and just shoving it up in their faces. Yes, that and it's inoculating their microbiome and it's like nature's way of kind of boosting our immune systems. And there's just, it's packed with minerals, minerals and all kinds of uh, carbon and good, good things that, you know, we actually evolved like consuming some portion of soil in our food. Mm -hmm. um, you know, evolutionarily, it helps us kind of become symbiotic and close to our native uh, microbiome of the local ecosystem so it's 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 just natural it's natural there's like a reason kids are drawn to it you know it's it's uh it's so beautiful i love it that's so great my wife and i um get into discussions i shouldn't say argue because we're not really <laughs> arguing but <laughs> but we get into discussions about washing vegetables you know because i'll say I'll say, no, I don't want to wash them because I want the dirt on them. And she's like, well, there's more than just dirt on them. You know, we got them from the grocery stores, you know, most of the time, at least right now, while we're still growing things. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you know, there's going to be other things on there. There's going to be other people touching them. There's going to be, um, you know, potentially blow by pesticides, you know, stuff like that too, even though we're buying all organic. Right. And so, uh, so what do you, what do you think in that situation? Which one should we be doing? Yes, that's why it's so important to grow your own because then you, you pick it fresh and then you, it's straight to plate. Like you don't have to worry about what else has it been exposed to. So yes, stuff from the grocery store, no matter what, definitely it's good to wash it because you don't know, um, you know what else it's been exposed to. And, and that's, that's the beauty too because like growing your own food, you know that you have put so much effort in, and you've imp improved the soil, whereas all soils are not equal. There's contaminants in some areas. And so you really don't know um, how your food was grown unless you do it yourself. So for me, yes, washing things from the grocery store, just because you don't know. And then that's all the more reason to grow your own food because then you, know, you're, you don't have to worry about what could be on it and what's not, you know, what, um, who else has been touching or if there's pesticides and stuff like that, you know that you just cut that and put it on your plate. And so when it comes to me growing my own food, if it's not by a road or something like that. If it's in like a secure, like secluded area um, where it's not potentially having any airborne things on it, definitely like eat it without washing it. That's how our ancestors did it. Um, it helps really connect you to the land. So I definitely, yep, that's how I do it. Well, rats. I'll, uh, I'll have to tell my wife that she's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, half correct, right? We'll, you know, give some to her. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. And so, so let's talk about eating soil. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talk about kids eating soil. How do we get more soil in our diet besides, I mean, do people actually eat it in larger quantities or should it just be consumed on these vegetables that are coming out of the garden? Yes, the, the best way is just having it natural amounts. Um, I know I've heard some stories of pregnant women who are just craving it because they need the minerals. So mm. in some countries, they, like, they do have so certain deposits where there's mineral-rich soils that they, they know about and they utilize. Um, but you don't have to really like go out of your way to consume it if you're getting exposure to being outside. And also you're getting exposure, like while you're growing food and you're out there gardening, you're going to be inhaling things in the air and stuff that's mm -hmm. stirred up. And it's just going to, to be, you're going to be exposed to it. So I would be very careful about going out of my way to consume soil there because our soils these days are contaminated in a lot of areas especially if you're doing like an urban garden or stuff like and stuff like that you want to make sure that you're not potentially ingesting excess amounts of lead so for me instead of um trying to purposely consume more soil um, unless it's on my food and because because that's how you get b12 and stuff like that for a lot of vegetarians um if you grow your own food a lot of the microbes 
contain that element or that vitamin and nutrient. But there are some other things you can do, like, like I said, besides gardening, there's some carbon sources like humic acids, fulvic acids, Sheila Jet, these products that are clean and tested. Um, that's my biggest thing I would like to stress is like you want to be really careful about um, the quality and any potential contaminants. So those carbon products are really good, the, the fulvic and humic acids and different products. Um, but yeah, I would be very cautious about any soil consuming it. Like if you don't, if you haven't had it tested and it's, I wouldn't go out of my way to ingest it um, besides on natural amounts, occurring amounts on the stuff you grow. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then what about testing? Where do we get our soil tested and how do we know if our soil is good enough for planting? Right. Well, there's definitely, there's multiple things you can be testing for. If, if I were in an urban area or a suburban area where there could have been previous construction or an older home that had like lead paint or something like that, there's local uh, municipalities, you know, you can check with to see where you can send off a sample for heavy metals and potential hydrocarbons if you're near like a freeway or a highway. So there's local place labs that you can have it tested or at your local land grant university, a lot of times they'll offer things um, spe specifically for heavy metals. And then when it comes to planting in it, there's, um, various labs that you can look at. Uh, I'm on the East Coast, so I have a couple labs here that I like, um, but it's just going to depend on where you are. And you want to send it in for, you want to see the available nutrients. You want to see um, kind of more than just the NPK, the nitrogen and, you know, kind of phosphorus and potassium stuff like that. Just the three elements that are usually in standard soil tests. You're going to you're going to have to look for a lab probably more than just a land grant university um, because you want to see calcium and magnesium. You want to see micro elements, um, all the things that you're going to want to adjust for in your soil potentially. So you can look for local soil labs and make sure that you are getting a test that offers you um, a wide array of minerals and nutrients. Um, so you're going to probably get an organic matter, a pH, and then NPK, and then uh, a broad spectrum analysis of the different elements in the soil. That's really a soil test offers you a good place to start, and it offers you a good place for, for amending any kind of uh, imbalances in magnesium to, carbon, uh, to calcium ratios for structure reasons, but it's just a place to start. It's just kind of what, so you know what's in the bank, right? What's in the bank account that you have. Because even though it says you might have a certain amount of calcium in your soil, it might not be available to your plants. It might be locked up or not in a bioavailable form. Just like when we take a multivitamin, mm -hmm. you, you're gonna, you wanna look for a bioavailable one because otherwise you're just excreting the like non-absorbable nutrients. So you, you want to make sure that, like I said, you're focusing on the soil microbes because what happens is the plant secretes things to feed the microbes and then the microbes can't, they can't just live off of the sugars and, and different metabolites that the plant feeds it. They need minerals. So the microbes go out into the soil, they get the minerals to build their bodies, and then when they get eaten by another microbe, that nutrient, the nutrients in its body and the minerals in its body are released in the rhizosphere, which is the root system of the plants, and then it's a bioavailable nutrient. So the plant would prefer to absorb all of its minerals um, from, micro from the microbial metabolites. So that's from when microbes are eaten, microbe excretions, you know, all the different um, more organic forms of elements. So like I said, Soil tests, look for a local lab that does a broad spectrum analysis of different um, elements. And that gives you a place to start. You can amend your soil as needed to kind of take care of deficiencies um, because that'll help um, kind of offset any potential for your plants to uptake heavy metals if they have everything they need. 
And then from there, you just support life so that you have access to those minerals. Awesome. Sorry, I nerd out like super hardcore. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm trying I was, to I was only swimming a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was great. I loved it. And so, and so then to follow up that, so then what is, what should I search on Google? Is it like soil testing my county or soil testing biggest city near me? Mm -hmm. So for me, I would just type in um, broad spectrum, like soil tests. And, and then you can say, uh, it's going to probably be regional more than state. Because for me, I'm, I go between New York and Virginia and I still use labs in Ohio, mm -hmm. you know, so I, there's a lab in Ohio called Logan labs and um, I love their tests because they, they're already used to people looking for this stuff. So probably it's probably going to be a private lab, but maybe if you're on the West coast, some of the universities off, have more offerings. Um, in Washington, you're probably going to have more of those um, agriculture, not just large scale ag kind of testing, but for but people who are interested in more of the broad spectrum. So yes, you just really any lab that offers more than just MPK is going to be good. So what you would do is once you look, find a place near you, you can either call them or you can look at the soil, like an example soil test, and you just wanna make sure that it's, um, you're selecting one that's more, um, gives you more elemental analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so is there anything wrong with like me in Seattle using Logan Labs in Ohio? No, it's, it's, gonna, okay. it's gonna be fine. Um, just longer turnaround. Yes. Yeah, because they, they'll email you the results. So, you know, as long as you, you ship it to them and it's such a, it's a small enough amount so that it, it's not going to cost too much. Logan Labs is just my favorite when it comes to this because they're used to people um, that are backyard gardeners. Sometimes they're, they don't, it, it's hard to convert it from like acres to square feet. <laughs> and so these people are already kind of aware of a lot of um, people doing it on a smaller scale. Excellent. So then mm -hmm. the next step is then you get that information back and it sounds like you're talking about, you know, making adjustments and things to give your soil. Is right. there a, what sort of resource do you recommend that, mm -hmm. uh, that we can kind of learn about how to do this? Cause I could see myself, I'd get the information back. I'd be like, what do I do with this? Right. Yes. So there's an organization called the Bionutrient Food Association and they have uh, if you go to like the resources and stuff on their website, they have a lot of information about how to interpret soil tests and, um, and what it means. And then you can also, um, I think Logan Labs offers like recommendations based on your soil test. So you could, you could um, tick an extra box to get recommendations back from them specifically. But really there's not uh, a lot of information. The, the most user-friendly kind of uh, garden scale people out there that I've seen would, would be Bionutrient Food Association um, or finding ag consultant uh, in your local area that, that is more aware of the more holistic approach. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. it, sounds like, it sounds like that would be a good course offering. It really would. I haven't seen uh, that many that offer it for small scale, like for backyard gardening. So in the, currently I'm in the process of creating kind of my, my own package to offer people because it's so hard to find all of the amendments that I want. Like every, I've moved a few times and every time I get to a new place, I have to like locate like where are the closest like mineral sources and rock dust quarries and like all this stuff. And so it, it's hard to get the stuff. Once you find it, it's hard to get it in the, like a, a quart sized jar or something small enough for your garden plot and you usually have to buy in bulk. So for the backyard gardener, it's, it's, it's kind of a challenge. Um, so it just takes a lot of Google searching. And then for me, I decided that I wanted to make a product for people because I wish I had one mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when I was like moving around. So, um, 
yeah, I don't know many options. You could definitely Google it. It would be more like looking for foliar or DIY recipes. Um, I could also share like a DIY recipe, like ebook for you for like ecological garden primer. So yeah, it's, there's so much information that, that it's, it's really easy to get overwhelmed, but if you keep it pretty, um, you know, simplified for yourself where you're like, okay, soil, and you start with like soil mineral balancing, there's, uh, actually there are some pretty good books I could share with, I could share with you um, to share with people because uh, I think there's the, um, what is it called? There's a couple, a couple books I'll have to share them with you. I have three books in mind and there's one called The Ideal Soil and there's one called The Intelligent Gardener. Um, but I, I could get some specifics. I, th I think that would help people a lot um, with the mineral balancing. So that'd be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's uh, foliar feeding. So there's different products that stimulate microbes. Um, and put carbon on into the soil which is like a food source so it gets there's so many things you can do and, and the beautiful thing is a lot of the stuff is in your kitchen already so there'll be a lot of yeah like my i have um i've heard some stories about uh grandmas and stuff who used to take sugar and they would sneak it and they would put it around their tomato plants um because they said it would make the tomatoes sweeter and what they didn't realize is that they were feeding the microbes because the microbes love sugar. And then there were more nutrients available to the tomato plant. So, so many things. Just look up biostimulants, look up, um, you know, microbial boosting recipes. Just a lot of, a lot of DIY recipes out there. Cool. I'm taking yep. notes. That's, <laughs> awesome. that's excellent. Yeah. I, I mean, I, my story is very similar in the sense that, you know, I created my programs because they weren't available. Right. You know, and there were certain things like I never wanted to treat infections, but mm. I found that I had to because my patients would get better to a certain point. And then I couldn't find anybody to help them get to the next level and help them treat in a natural way. So mm. I had to learn this stuff and then incorporate all of it. So I totally get it. I, I'm, I'm excited for when you have that course come out. No pressure. Yes. <laughs> awesome. I'll be sure to let you know. I'm sure you got nothing else to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that is my life. So it's, it's definitely, definitely something I enjoy doing. So. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's dive into another question here. So let's talk about food in the garden versus food from the grocery store. So we're talking about energy. We're talking about nutrition. How do those different types of produce differ? So the stuff that you find in the grocery store, it's usually picked before it's ripe. Mm. Otherwise, it wouldn't be shelf stable for long enough for them to get it from the farm to the distributing facilities to the grocery stores. Because usually, who knows how long it's been since that you know tomato has been picked. Normally, they're picked green and then they're force ripened or they're sent to the grocery store. They're red by the time they get to the grocery stores. But that's just like a false um, kind of, that's why you get a lot of tomatoes and they don't have a lot of flavor because they're picked before they're ripe. So mm -hmm. when it comes to produce at the grocery store, um, you don't know how long it's been picked. You, you don't know what, how it's been grown. And so when it comes to ripeness, you really need to be eating things that have, picked, have been picked after the ripe because a plant does not want you to pick a tomato before it's ripe because the seeds are not viable yet. Mm -hmm. So a plant makes the ripe tomato so much more appealing to animals because it wants the seeds to be spread only when they're ready. So nature already has it intended. We, when we eat like a carrot that's bitter or that doesn't taste good, it's because it's lacking certain balances of, of minerals in it and different aromatic compounds and plant secondary metabolites that give it flavor. So a lot of times the, the stuff grown at the grocery store is grown for quantity over quality and it's grown for appearance versus the actual nutritional value of it. So people are geared towards thinking that it has to, everything has to be perfect in, in the same size and shape. And really it's, uh, that's not how it, 
normally looks, you know, when you grow it yourself. And a lot of times when people garden and grow their own produce, there it looks beautiful and there's like all kinds of interesting shapes and different things that happen. And then also that's why you won't taste a tomato from the store that tastes like one from your backyard. You just can't compare it. So it's it's also what I've found is that you can taste the love in the food. You can taste all the effort, the hard work, the love, the intention that's been put into the food. And somehow that's way more uplifting and empowering. Um, and the nutritional quality of food grown at home, it it's harvested and then it's eaten super fresh, super close to when it was, it has more, it retains more of the nutritional value. Because as soon as you start, if you cut something, some, uh, you know, kale or something like that, it's, it's not getting fresher, <laughs> you know? Um, so for me, the stuff, yes, you can get high quality stuff by, you know, looking at it on the shelves and looking for the best and most vibrant looking produce or shopping at a local farmer's market. And that's all great. And if you can grow anything in your backyard or in containers or something like that, it's so worth it because you will feel a difference. I know that for me, when I started growing my own produce, it just felt so much more nourishing. I, felt, I didn't even have to eat as much. It's, it's so much more dense and, or balanced and full of nutrition that the satisfaction just is so much easier to be satiated. And I also noticed this um, even in, when I was in school is that the school offered, um, it's called a veg bag scheme. And so they had local farmers contribute organic produce to a vegetable like CSA type thing. And me and my partner both noticed the difference when we were cooking food with that produce versus the stuff from the local big chain supermarket. Mm. Even organic stuff from there, it, it's still we noticed that we were like, wow, like I feel so much better. And like my, my energy is so much more stable. And then also you just, it just tastes better. You, you know, like there's something where you don't have to, when it's not empty calories, you actually like hit a point where you're like, no, I'm done. And because of that, you don't overeat and you don't get weighed down and your, your like digestive system doesn't get overwhelmed. So yeah, eating eating homegrown food, it's just so much nourishing on, on so many different levels. Yeah, I remember when my, my daughter was young and she would, like she doesn't really like Brussels sprouts, but she would eat them right out of the garden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they called them mini cabbages, you know, and she would just Aww. chomp down on them or kale. She'd eat right out of the garden, but she wouldn't eat it if it was on the table. Mm-hmm. You know, and so sometimes it was the same kale, but it was like, you know, she wanted the absolute freshest thing that was going to be available. And that's kind of what she was drawn to. Right. Yeah. I had um, a friend who he has a farm and he had a young child and they were like five years old. Um, and they would have their mother babysit him. And she would bring, she, she brought him home one day and she was like, he wouldn't eat the carrots. He just would eat the peanut butter off of them and leave the carrot sticks. And as soon as she like dropped him off that day and was telling uh, his dad about it, he walks right over into the garden, pulls up a carrot out of the garden and just starts eating it with the, with the soil all over it, like all over his face. And it's just, kids know, you know, like, right. so it, it, I don't know, it was just, it was such a cute story. And I was, that's so true though, the, those like baby carrots from the store, um, you know, right. who, knows, who knows how long ago they've been picked, but the stuff from home, like his dad was growing amazing food. That's, you know, he, he knew the difference. So thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you're ready to stop missing important events and opportunities, have robust energy and be excited about life again, please go to fixyourfatigue.com and sign up for a free strategy session with me or register for a power packed webinar showcasing my unique process that's helped thousands of people resolve their fatigue. You can take control and fix your fatigue. I promise. The tools are waiting for you at fixyourfatigue.com. So you mentioned CSA. So for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with that, can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yep, a CSA is called, it's um, Community Supported Agriculture. 
So in some areas, there might be a farm that's big enough to supply um, maybe six to 12 different varieties of produce each season. And you sign up ahead of time and you're kind of supporting the farmer in initially in the year by paying up front. And so they have enough money to, to get all their seeds and their supplies for the season and to start growing. And then you just either pick up a delivery um, or pick it up from the farm or a specific location or it's delivered to your door. Um, they, they function differently in different locations. And um, there's also some which are kind of co-ops. So it's, it's like a CSA, but maybe there's a few different farmers who come together and they, they make up a box between what they've all grown. And it's just a way for people to, to connect more with their local food and, and support the, the people growing it and get really fresh produce. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I'm totally convinced that I need to eat closer to the <laughs> ground. Um, yes. And for, we're going to get into tips in just a second, but for those people who are kind of overwhelmed by doing their own garden, is CSA like the next best option? Yes, definitely. Yep. The more local you can go, the better. And are oftentimes when they're delivering that box, have they been picked that morning or do you know if it was picked the previous day or, or it's different? When I, yeah. When I've worked on farms um, around this area, there's a lady who, who supplies restaurants and stuff with produce and also has a few CSA customers. It's picked either that morning or it's picked the day before and packaged that night and then sent out to the, the driver who delivers it the next day. Nice. And so yep. then, and so then what is ideal for picking to consumption? How many, I know you talked about the grocery stores, you know, are obviously on a longer time delay. Mm -hmm. What What is ideal? Is that one day? Is it three days? What's ideal? Well, it's going to depend on the type of produce it is. Your leafy vegetables, your green stuff like that, they, it, the sooner, the better. Uh, when it comes to say like, watermelons or squash or stuff like that some stuff actually does get better <laughs> like in a way where more of the things might be converted to sugars and stuff like that and get sweeter so for in my what what i like to do is the stuff that could wilt i like to decrease it to you know use it within a week of harvesting and then uh, but what i've noticed is that when you grow it yourself um it actually lasts a lot longer because there's a higher quote unquote like sugar content or what they call bricks reading. So my, uh, my other farmer friend, she had some kale in the back of her fridge that she forgot about for like a month and she found it later and it was still completely fresh. Wow. And that was one stuff that she had grown. So yeah, it, it can last a long time. The, the quality, starting out really determines like how long it's, la it's lasting. Cause if you pick a carrot, um, you know, if, it's, if you have a higher quality carrot and a low quality carrot, you pick them at the same time, you have more to start out with, with the high quality carrot as far as like amount of nutrition. So it really, for me, if it's something that wilts fast, I like to eat it fast within about a week. And most other things, you know, depending on, on quality, that's that's about the time frame I'd like as well is within a week of harvesting and then for some things like squashes like the winter squashes that's there's less um issue there when it comes to how long it's been picked because usually some there's squashes that can last all winter in, uh -huh. a, in a in a root cellar so you know carrots squash stuff like that it's not as pertinent but if it can wilt you definitely want to use it quickly. Awesome. That's mm -hmm. great advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also when it comes to the greens and stuff that can wilt, one trick that you can do is to stick it in a glass of water and put that in your fridge. So mm -hmm. fresh herbs. I've had so many experiences where the cilantro just would go bad before I could use it or wilts or stuff like that. So putting things uh, like that or celery and stuff, uh, into or green onions into a glass of water in the fridge or a bunch of kale it'll stay vibrant and it won't wilt so definitely recommend that cool so should we do that with 
all of those that might potentially wilt or just at the first sign of it wilting? No, as soon as you get home from the grocery store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And if you have some that's kind of slightly started to wilt and you do that, you'll notice it perk back up. Okay, nice. Yep. So let's talk about um, soil rotation. Mm -hmm. So right now I've got a greenhouse mm -hmm. and we've planted a number of different lettuce in there and we're gonna harvest those shortly. We've got some butter leaf and we've got some, some bitter stuff. Do I plant lettuce back in there or is there a different, is something else that I should plant that'll be healthier for that soil? Mm -hmm. Well, lettuce isn't, isn't usually like a heavy feeder. So some things are considered heavy feeders and that they, they use a lot from the soil, mm. like your tomatoes and corn, stuff like that. But when it comes to some, there's a lot of people who are really heavy believers in like rotational planting or crop rotation. And I have a few different opinions about it because where there's some people who are growing food, some people do it because of to break pest cycles. So they'll grow a specific family of crops one season, like they'll, they'll rotate each family of crop with a different one that doesn't share the same pest and disease, like, um, you know, your cucurbits, which is like your squashes or melons or cucumbers. Um, they'll rotate that with like a green or something like spinach in a different family. And so there's some people who do it for pest reasons. And when it comes to that mentality, um, I am on a different page because I believe that pests and disease only show up, they're, they're nature's cleanup crew. So I believe they only show up when there's food that's suited for them because usually they show up when a plant is sick or a plant doesn't have a good balance of um, different amino acids or it doesn't have complete um, you know, complex sugars and stuff like that. So it's actually insect food. It's not gonna be able to procreate a high quality seed for the next generation. So it's like the insects and these disease show up because there's a deficiency or an imbalance. Mm. And so I don't rotate out of fear as much as, you know, it, it would be more um, the, the level of feed, of, like how much is removed from the soil. So that's one, uh, Thing. For me, though, it's more sometimes just convenience. If, if I have one bed that I'm having short rotations in, like lettuce, which sometimes it fizzles out in the heat of the summer, so you want to keep replanting. Mm -hmm. And I would do like lettuce all season because my other beds might have longer growing things like tomatoes and zucchini and stuff that I'm coming again to harvest. Um, so those beds are staying in the same crop all season, whereas I'll have some beds that I just keep successional planting. And so for me, it just depends on the situation. I'm not really afraid of disease or pests, so that doesn't really hold me back from planting the same thing because sometimes if you keep planting the same thing in the soil, you have the perfect microbes present that know how to support that plant already. Mm -hmm. So if you are, are you know if you want to rotate for nutritional reasons um you know from year to year that's that's totally fine but i don't feel that it's necessary um if it makes planning complicated awesome mm -hmm. well that's that's a relief yes <laughs> it's like that was just one more thing to make it right. complicated right yeah we want to remove all the barriers that people can possibly have to gardening exactly yeah what if your fatigue was not beyond your control what if you could literally fix your fatigue thank you for listening to my podcast where i bring you top health experts and leaders from around the world to discuss the hurdles and solutions to fatigue and the 33 different things that can cause it if you're ready to have robust energy and be excited about life again, please go to fixyourfatigue.com and sign up for a free strategy session with me or register for a power pack training webinar. You can take control and fix your fatigue. I promise. Solutions and support are waiting for you at fixyourfatigue.com.
So great. So let's let's dive in to what are your top tips for a successful and stress-free garden? So for me, the, the number one is mulching because a lot of people, their biggest barrier to gardening is the maintenance, so weeding, and also um, plants getting sick and stuff like that. So when you mulch, like I mulch my paths, I mulch my beds, I mulch everything, any exposed soil I try to cover because that's a potential place where a weed might come up um, or also I like to uh, retain the moisture. So mulch is a great way to do that as well. And when you retain the moisture, that supplies, uh, that helps support the life that supplies the nutrients to your plants. So the, the, the fastest way to short circuit your garden, like your plant health, is to let the soil dry out. Mm. That's, you know, so a lot of people will notice their zucchini plant looks super healthy in the beginning of the season, but as the heat of the summer kicks in, the, the leaves might start drooping. And as soon as that starts happening, that's when like disease can come in because the plant is susceptible. Mm -hmm. So mulching is a great way to kind of stabilize the moisture levels between waterings and also protect the microbes. So mulching materials that I like to use are shredded leaves. Make sure they're shredded, otherwise they will blow away. Um, and straw is really good. You wanna be careful to avoid hay because it usually has seeds on it. The difference between hay and straw is that usually the seed heads have been harvested already and the straw is like the leftover stalks. And then um, in my pathways, I like wood chips because normally I do like bermed beds. So I do like mounds. I do like permanent kind of raised beds. And in the kind of indents between my beds, I like fill them with wood chips because it kind of acts as a sponge and if it rains, they soak up all the rain. And then after it's done raining, the, the moisture can kind of seep out of them into the beds later. So definitely mulching is number one. And uh, the second tip would be irrigation, especially if you're busy, because sometimes it's really easy to forget or get too busy and not have time to water your garden. And just installing like simple sprinkler system or uh, soaker hoses, which are really easy to just put into your bed and hook up to a faucet, uh, drip tape if you want to get fancy. Some people, they have different apps and technology where it can be set on a timer or they can push a button from their phone. Like <laughs> There's so many ways to like set it up to make it work for you. And, um, you know, if it's small enough, yeah, wiring can, but, but definitely irrigation makes life a lot easier. And when you do irrigate, I highly recommend anytime you're watering your garden to have a filter to filter out chlorine and chloramine. Um, and they sell them, it's just called like a garden hose filter or just a garden water filter. Uh, it just screws on to either the, the, the hose or the faucet itself and then the hose attaches to it. They're, they're like 20 bucks. They're really cheap nice. um, and super worth it. Um, and then besides like keeping your soil covered, keeping it moisturized, I definitely would say to um, have like a permanent system. So decrease disturbance. Um, for me, I, that means permanent raised beds that I disturb the soil once and then I don't have to disturb it much after that. So I build my beds and then next season I might come in with a broad fork. And I like that kind of sticks into the soil and lifts it, but it, it doesn't turn the soil over because as soon as you turn the soil over and expose it to oxygen, the carbon off gases as carbon dioxide and you lose the, the carbon in your soil, which is what makes it spongy, increases water retention, um, is homes for microbes. So you don't want to excessively till or disturb your soil. Mm. Um, if you possibly can and that's why raised beds are great because you don't usually have to do much after you build them maybe just fluff it a little bit and then um, when it comes to I think for me personally the thing that I like to nerd out about is just garden nutrition because I don't have to fight anything like it's a different mentality it's like a mentality that's like supporting the system just like we have innate immune systems and mm. when we walk into a room if there's like full of people if there's one sick person not everybody gets sick 
So the same idea is with my plants. I like to make sure I'm providing all the nutritional needs of the plant. Um, if it's not it's directly with uh, different organic amendments, then with supporting the microbes. So I do, I do kind of a garden maintenance program where I'll have like a seaweed spray. It's just liquid seaweed or liquid kelp. And I'll just dilute that in water. And if I know it's gonna be a really hot day, that morning when I do my watering, I'll water kelp because it helps plants with stress. So I'll do that during the summer. And then also um, I have like organic amendments that I use like nutritional, like bioavailable uh, foliar sprays. And then I also add in biostimulants to, to boost the microbes to make sure that they're supplying the plant with all of the minerals I applied to the soil earlier. So yeah, those are my, those are my, the thing, the things I think you can do in your garden to remove the stress of it. Um, nutrition so you don't have to fight with disease and insect pests. Um, less disturbance so you support your microorganisms. Irrigation, mulching so you don't have weeds. There is one more thing and that would be, depending on where you are, some kind of barrier. Because the thing about growing food that's food like for people versus insects is that and when you make your produce so healthy that's going to taste amazing the animals know that too mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh the rabbits or deer you want to make sure you have some kind of barriers so that you can actually enjoy the harvest um or like my grandpa does he says i'll just plant an extra few plants so that i can they can have some and i can have some too so whatever your strategy to, to kind of compensate for, you know, more animals wanting to eat your food, that is definitely uh, would be a tip as well. <laughs> That's awesome. Your grandpa yeah. sounds like a really cool guy. <laughs> yes, he is. I'm really excited. I'm about to move down there and start farming with him. Oh, that's yes. awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's super cool. Yep. So um, we're just about out of time now. So okay. I'd love to... I mean, this has been so amazing. I, you know, you, you've just shared so many great tips. Hopefully, you know, people are, are excited about gardening. What would be, you know, what's the big takeaway that you see here that is really practical for folks that, um, that you really want to motivate people to do? I really want to just motivate people to just start growing something. Just whatever it is, you don't have to grow a whole garden. Maybe this year you just want to try growing carrots, you know, or lettuce or like one thing just try growing it because it might seem overwhelming but as soon as you do it and you harvest your first one you're going to be hooked and i want everybody to to be hooked on gardening because it's such an amazing habit <laughs> um and yeah i just you don't have to get complicated with all of my nerdiness all you have to do is buy really good quality seeds like organic seeds and uh put some love into it and I believe that green thumbs are, it's just based on intention. So good intentions and just try it, try growing your own food and you'll taste the difference and you'll feel the difference. That's great. Just yeah. do it. Just do it. <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so tell us about um, this film. Mm -hmm. Grow food. So, film. Yeah. Um, so it's called grow food my my whole message i just feel like everybody um should try growing food because it's, it's an amazing experience uh, my partner joe Brignola and i kind of one day met up because uh, i had been working with him on other projects and i got i used to be really nervous around people so when i would actually go see people in person when i wasn't in a garden hiding uh, i would start talking about soil and so and nerding out and I was like, we have to tell everybody about this. We have to tell the world. And he likes making movies. So we were like, okay, let's make a movie. And then we started uh, traveling and going to different um, kind of cool operations where people are growing food for, with juvenile detention centers, with schools for the deaf and blind, with like um, different community kind of urban agriculture setups and and we went to Dan Kittredge's farm, who's the founder of the Bionutrient Food Association. And with all of that, 
all of that kind of supports the central story of this one guy that we found who was on Long Island and he had no land, but he wanted to farm. And so he started farming on people's front lawns. And we follow his story, his trials and tribulations, and we kind of weave in this whole idea that most of the problems in the world can be solved by growing food. Mm. Mm-hmm. So. That individuals grow food. Yes. That we, all, that we all step up and start doing that. Right, because a lot of the problem, um, you know, besides the climate, environment, ecosystem, uh, embodied energy, despite all that, there's, there's more than enough food, but there's a distribution um, issue. And so by more people growing food locally, we increase food access and get more food to the people who need it. Awesome. Yep. Oh my gosh. Especially <laughs> now with what you're hearing about supply chains and whatnot and issues with that. Yeah. It's so important. Yep. yep. So many, so many good reasons to get back to gardening. Right. I mean, we did it before with the victory gardens and we were growing 40% of our food, like our fruit and vegetable intake back then. Um, definitely doable Mm -hmm. yeah awesome great and so when is the film coming out well we're going to be doing a screening of it online for free starting may 16th and um, you can check that out by going to growfoodfilm.com slash watch and you'll get all the information you can sign up and register and see it when it goes live awesome yeah we'll put all the links in the show notes awesome sounds good Cool. Well, Jessica, it's been really a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing all of your amazing knowledge with us today. I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more fatigued people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have on fatigue is one of my absolute favorite things to do. If you'd like more information, please sign up for my newsletter, where I share all important facts and information about fatigue, from the foods and supplements to the programs and products that I use personally and recommend to others so that they can live their best lives. Just go to fixyourfatigue.com forward slash newsletter to sign up, and I will send you this great information. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for help with your fatigue, you can visit my website and work with us at fixyourfatigue.com. And remember, It's important that you have someone in your corner who is a credentialed healthcare professional to help you make changes. This is very important, especially when it comes to your health. Thanks for listening and have an amazing day. Thanks for having me. I've had such a blast. I don't get to nerd out enough. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. You too.